Yes, yes, I'm back on camera. Yes. All right, simmer down. A few months later, and the elites of my list have been itching to make their presence known. Ah! Notice me! I'm the Bobbis, and today I'll be wrapping up the top five of my top ten list of minor adult characters on Bob's Burgers. This list will feature the most influential characters that the show either can't do without, or whose existence has left a lasting impression on the Belcher family and its large fan base. Long overdue, but welcome back to the countdown. Yeah, you like how these fingers feel? Hmm? Yeah, you do, don't you? Huh? Yeah, I bet you never had someone this good. Oh, you make me feel like a king. Jimmy, my kids are right here. Oh. Please stop, we're just leasing it. Jimmy Pesto zooms into the fifth spot, and though he's far from my favorite character on the show, the strength behind his rivalry with Bob can't be denied. Jimmy Pesto first appeared in the fan favorite episode Sheesh Cat Bob, where the writers wasted no time establishing the aforementioned rivalry. I want you to shave your mustache and bring it over in a baggie and I'll pin it on the wall. If you want a bag of hair so bad, why don't you just pick it out of the food you serve here? I do often wonder what broiled the beef between Jimmy and Bob in the first place. Did Jimmy catch wind of Bob's delicious food and quality ingredients slashing out in jealousy? Or did Bob notice the influx of business at Jimmy's place and lash out in jealousy? Obviously, the former seems more plausible, but with season one, Bob, you know, the one that probably smoked crack, anything is possible. I may or may not have tried crack. Okay. Last night. I don't think I did. But if I did, I liked it. <laughs> Bob's Burgers eventually found its niche by becoming one of the most wholesome animated sitcoms on television, but with that said, the Belcher-Pesto rivalry has been a constant mainstay. This rivalry will go on not only to affect Bob, but also Tina and Louise, given the fact that Tina has her crush on Jimmy Jr. and Louise is friends with Andy and Ollie, each of whom are the sons of Jimmy Pesto Sr. No, 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 I'm calling a ban on all the Pesto kids. Our kids are going to cease contact. After years of their conflict being one of the cornerstones of the show's humor, the writers began taking their dynamic in a different song softer direction as evidenced by both seasons 10 and 11. I thought they would like your food and then they would like me because I recommended you and that's how I'd get into the thing. You thought they would like my food? Oh, it sounds gross when you say it. I really don't have time to be insulted right now because of all the customers we have. Yeah, you got them packed in like sardines. They look a little drunk and bloated. You know what? Not bad. Guess I rubbed off on you a little bit. I'm proud of you, Bob. What? Happy Valentine's Day, pal. Really proud. He's proud of you. What's that feel like? With these scenes in mind, it seems that Bob is the one who can't let go of the animosity, considering that he immediately told Jimmy that he doesn't want him to be proud of him, and also suspected that Jimmy was up to no good for the Yacht Club recommendation. And while I can't necessarily blame Bob for his reactions, I would appreciate a dynamic where they are actual friends that still poke fun at each other to their respective dismay. But maybe their continued beef is for the best, considering that there's been a ton of complaint over the years that Bob's Burgers has become too wholesome and lost its edge, so to speak. It's for this reason, after Jay Johnson's involvement in the Jan 6 thing and subsequent dismissal from the voice role is Jimmy Pesto. We don't talk about Bruno, no, no, no. I believe that after Jimmy finally returned in season 14, we can see that he's still his old self. Why are you coming over here? Ah, I'm bored. You must know what that's like, right? Cause of your life? Ha! <laughs> Shout out to Eric Bowser for doing a wonderful job as Jimmy Pesto, by the way. And if you're watching this video, which I highly doubt because no one gives a shit about my channel, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show and Jimmy Pesto into the fifth spot on my list. You guys, you, you don't have to leave right away. Well, if we stay, what would we do? Merry Christmas Eve Day! I got you something, Bob. Um, uh, okay. Uh, thanks. Aww. Well, open it! Oh no, you've never received a gift before. You don't know what to do. Calvin Fishoulder bought his way into the fourth spot, and ordinarily I don't take bribes, but, um... Daddy needed a new pair of glasses. Yes, yes Mr. Mr. Fishoder is, is an eccentric. eccentric. Yes, yes, he wears a white suit and, and an eye patch. patch. And he, he drives, drives a, a golf, golf cart, cart everywhere. everywhere. He is one white cat away from being a super villain. But as Bob's landlord and sometimes confidant, there's no way he wouldn't make the list. On the surface, it may seem that he doesn't like Bob, but as an avid watcher of the show, it becomes easy to not only see that he likes Bob, but has an unusual infatuation with him. Your mustache. It's... 
fascinating. Thank you. Do you mind if I... You're touching it. Yeah. I... That's... Yeah, yeah. It's really something. Thank you. Thank you. Have you ever tried brushing it this way? Like this? No, uh, but I will. It's a good look for you. All that said, they do share a kind of dynamic that it seems they were going with Jimmy Pesto because even though he does like him, he subjected him to a myriad of insults. Loose lips, wide hips, large nips, I assume. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. And I'm just gonna go on record saying that like with season one, Bob, we have to treat season one, Calvin, with a bit of retroactive continuity. You know, the one that literally shot at Bob. No, Gene, don't worry about the advertising. What are you doing? It's a starter's pistol. It's a real gun, you should get down. What? Stop shooting, this is crazy. I can't believe him. Another thing I appreciate about Calvin and Bob's relationship is that with Bob always being late on the rent and Calvin always engaging in odd things, he likes to call on Bob whenever he needs a favor of sorts, such as the time he wanted Bob to throw a gingerbread competition so he didn't have to lose, or the time that he wanted to borrow Linda and the family to make another woman jealous. Okay, him. Ah! Whoa. Get your lips off her! Oh, everybody wants everybody. This is so exciting! I respect myself too much not to be the other woman which happens to be one of four times Bob was almost shot dealing with Calvin. Calvin Fishholder is a very wealthy man who owns half, if not everything, in Seymour's Bay. This becomes especially apparent in one of my favorite episodes, The Older Games, an obvious parody of The Hunger Games where Bob bands the town together to confront Calvin about a town-wide rent hike. So, do we have an alliance? Hell yeah! I'm the catnest to your pita bread! This episode is one of the few that showcases Calvin's softer side as he was hurt that Bob wouldn't have a discussion with him in lieu of rounding up an angry mob like they were after Dr. Frankenstein's monster. I've known you a long time and I just realized now I might have hurt your feelings. Here's the thing, Bob. I like you. You're good people, sort of. You don't have to say sort of. And I've always thought of myself as the kind of landlord you could pal around with. Someone you could pat on the butt as a sign of affection. I would, I, I would do that. No, but don't touch me. Mr. Fishholder is such a dynamic character that his entry on this list could have just as easily been one badass supercut that I'll probably make in the coming weeks. And obviously that level of dynamic is deserving of the fourth spot on this list. This is one of my vacant spaces. It used to be a burger restaurant. Hi, Bob. Mr. Fishholder, this is still a burger restaurant. Yeah, let us die slowly in peace, you vulture. Right you are. One bad review won't sink the SS Bob, will it? Let's come back in a week. It should be empty by then. So I wanted to take a moment to apologize for the long delay between parts one and two of this countdown. My long form content didn't seem to be as appealing, so I wanted to gather a bit larger of a following before making this video, which is why I've mostly been focused on my trailers and super cuts. So hopefully there are enough for you to make this video worthwhile. That said, please do me the kindness of subscribing, liking, and commenting to let me know if this is the kind of content you'd like to continue to see. So, it's that time again that we reach the top three of the list and I'm ready to award these medals to the best of the greatest. Oh my gosh, this was not in the script because I didn't realize that I have no idea where the first place medal is. Like, I looked everywhere for it and I'm just thinking, probably because they're just gold and shiny. I was just fiddling with it at my desk while I was working and I I did not throw it away. Oh my god. I'm gonna have something for the number one spot on the list, I promise. So, just like before, comment who you think is going to, I guess I can't say take home the gold, right? But comment who you think is gonna get the number one spot and let me know if you got it right or you got it wrong. I'm curious just how many of you great minds out there are thinking alike. So, what's next for you, Mickey? What are you gonna do? Going straight, Bob. I'm gonna get a job, find myself a gal, or build a, a barn, maybe. Um, Paint the barn with the gal. Put the gal in the barn and yeah maybe you know american dream gal in a barn there were a couple of characters that i considered but mickey's robbed them all of the third spot again with bob's burgers being the cornerstone of wholesome entertainment it's no surprise that its criminals would be equally wholesome well except for this guy we first meet Mickey in the Bob Day Afternoon episode where he tries to rob a bank without his usual partner Rodney and ends up botching the entire operation. Rodney? Mickey, hey, what's up? Oh, not much. Uh, I botched a job, man. The cops are everywhere. What do I do? Are there cops on the phone? Yeah, but I'm whispering. Yeah, we can't hear anything. Go ahead. Mickey seems to me an all-around well-meaning guy, and he said that he and Rodney just fell into the habit of bank robbing, but truth be told, Mickey strikes me as the kind of character that would easily fall to peer pressure. He does end up taking Bob Hostage, but only out of impulse. He was never in any real danger from anyone outside of the cops that were failing to resolve the situation. So uh, here's the burgers. Ah! Bobby! How did you miss that? Patty got in the way. Yeah, it's a code name again, Bob. We see at the end of his debut episode that there's a great guy there with a good heart, but circumstances just seem to unfold negatively for him. Hey, Bob, you know when they uh, caught up to Rodney? They tackled him and his pants came halfway down. He splayed out like that with his hands on his head, ass in the breeze. It's like his pants just kind of gave up. 
my pants are staying on. So thanks for that, Bob. Thanks for everything. But as the old adage goes, all the habits die hard, and he's clearly made multiple attempts at going down the right path, with an equal amount of attempts at going down the wrong one. We'll later see Mickey again in the episode when Bob fires the kids, aptly titled, where Mickey's released from jail and Bob lets him stay in the basement, but things kinda go south. Everybody on the floor! Ooh, ooh. This is a stick-up! Ah, uh, Mickey! Uh, you're out of the sleeve! Bob, Linda, bring it in. So, are you cool with me finishing my tunnel? No! You may not tunnel through my basement to a bed. I forbid it. Fine then, Bob. Why don't you fire me? Okay, you're fired! A rinse and repeat later sees Mickey working at Wonder Wharf where he makes a decent living, but after Louise and the kids find Ambergris that's illegal to sell, Louise becomes a bad influence on Mickey as one of the other well-known criminals. Supercut. Mickey, 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 Mickey! Come on, man! It's one last job! This is my last job. This is my last job moment. This is the one I do and then I die or go to jail at the end. No, 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 no. This is the one you do and then you are golden. Oh, okay. Speaking of criminal, did Tina Loki get $200 out of the robbery? If you recall, she said she had $80 in her savings and Mickey saved her $200. So did she get the $200? Because we never exactly see Bosco take the money from her. Hey, give me that! No, no! I need that for evidence! I will punch you! No, I will punch you! He will! I'll leave that up to interpretation, but if you ask me, Tina's winning. Even though Mickey's only been in about six or seven episodes, the impression that he leaves always makes it feel that he's been around much longer. In fact, he even had a role in the Bob's Burgers movie. The first shift oh, folks made a nice little memorial to put on the pier in his old spot, and us second shift folks are uh, doing this. And that level of impression awards Mickey the bronze medal for staying out of trouble and keeping his pants up. Bob, what do I do? I've never been an innocent bystander before. Just get your hands up, Mickey. Uh, like that? What? No, up. Like this? The, no, you're doing like kitty paws. Up, up higher. Higher, like that? No, all the way up. Like, past my shoulders. I can't really help you sell a motorcycle that's probably stolen, I'm assuming. Nark! Bob, the bike's not stolen. It's made from stolen parts. Once you put them all together, it's a brand new bike. Keeping the criminal theme going, Critter rides into the second spot, and most likely on a bike that has some stolen, stolen qualities. Quality. Critter debuts in another fan favorite episode, Earsy Rider, where it's easy to have vicarious annoyance for him and his biker gang due to Bob's initial distaste for them. Oh god, don't come here. No, 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 no. Welcome! He's at first painted as a booze-soaked dangerous outlaw who's the leader of a biker gang called the One-Eyed Snakes. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want them. But after Bob pretty much lets his crew have the run of the place, Critter gives him a token of their appreciation by which Bob is none too flattered. Here. Uh, what's this? It means we owe you one. Put in your window. Nobody will mess with you. The A-plot finds Louise being bullied by Logan Bush, who also has his debut in the same episode, and after he steals her bunny ears, Louise eventually cashes in the token from the one-eyed snakes. You took my ears and threw them away, and now these guys are going to take your ears and throw them away. What? Uh, oh god, don't cut my ears off! I hate when shirt tags stick out. Here, here, here! I never threw them out, okay? I'm so sorry. My, my ears! Though Critter does seem that he can be a pretty dangerous guy, he knows not to cross the line to harm a child, so he certainly wouldn't have been cutting off any ears. He would have. No, I wouldn't. He would. I'm telling you, I would not. I think you would You don't know my mind! The end of the episode finds Critter becoming a father after his soon-to-be significant other, Mudflop. Mudflop? Who the f*** is Mudflop? The end of the episode sees Critter becoming a father after his soon-to-be significant other, Mudflap, has a baby in the restaurant. Use take two. Since then, Critter's gone on a less outlawed path and developed their relationship with Bob and the kids as a result. So how much is it gonna cost us, Critter? Oh, come on, I can't charge you guys. Our kid was born inside your restaurant. I think my favorite episode where Critter appears is the one titled Wag the Hog, where he enlists Bob to sell a motorcycle to some financial suit, causing Bob to have the don a semi-tough personality, or mustache mani. I start today at four. If I don't show up, I don't have a job. And if I don't have a job, I can't provide for my family. But I guess I could always go back to Robin. Oh, come on, Critter. Luton. Critter. Coming up with more and more interesting ways to sell crystal methamphetamine. Critter. But maybe you could live with that. Maybe I had you wrong. Okay, fine. I'll help you. Oh, thank you, Bob. I'm eternally grateful. See you soon. Love you. Bye. Love you, too. What happened? You love him? That leads to one of my favorite lines in the show. 
Your biker name is Mustache Manny, and he once ate somebody's eyebrows for looking at you funny. Uh, 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 uh. Carl, we know you have Critter's bike in there. Give it back now, or I'm gonna eat your eyebrows. What? I mean, I'm gonna sta I'll stab you. Eat your eyebrows. That scene always gets me, I swear to God. But just like Mickey, we finally see Critter getting a steady job in retail, and it's clear that he values taking care of his family more than raising hell with the snakes. Ugh. I can't look at you like that. I know, I can't look at myself. But he gets the silver medal for being a badass that has his priorities straight. Your bread is, uh, whoop, hey, there it goes. It got away from me there, sorry about that. So it didn't get away from you, you threw it. No, it's bad, I was trying to spare your feelings, but if you want to address it, oh, it's I not very no. good bread. Yeah, 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 forget it. Yeah, unnecessary little confrontation here. So, did your favorite not make the list so far? Then perhaps before I reveal my top pick, you'll find them in my honorable mentions. Bled is psychic, what's your special power? I can crack anyone's back. Bob, come here. All right, just this mm -hmm. one. Whoa. Oh, right there. There we go. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'll lay you down on the floor now. Mushroom, get off me. That's not helping. Oh my god. It's a knot. That's all it is. I can't breathe. That was the wine company on the phone. And it turns out that the Pinot Grigio has been recalled. It's, uh, it's got poison in it. How much poison are we talking? Linda, you know me. I can have a little poison. <laughs> oh, shell, yes. How does a mermaid even ride one of those? Check family fun time. That's where old games go to die. Bleep, 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 bleep. That's the sound of a game die. One, two, three, four. I found it. know what happens when real people drive around hanging out of a sunroof? Yeah. Decapitation. But you didn't hear anything about it, I'm sure, right? Right? I, I didn't hear anything. Yeah, about. not a word. Government covered it up. Oh my gosh. Thomas Hanks himself got paid a bunch of hush money. How much? Around $12,000. That all checks out. All right, so where to? Sad girl, you want to go run over this kid who dumped you or what? Nat Keeble has driven her pink limo not only into the number one spot, but also the hearts of fans everywhere. And I know how her name sounds, but... Wait, your name is Nat Kinkle? Yeah, Nat Kinkle. K-I-N-K-L-E. How are you hearing it? Nat is like the best kind of gal pal that anyone can hope to have. She has this laid-back, ride-or-die personality that's easy to acclimate to. The show immediately establishes her as someone with a caring personality that if anyone's in need, she'll show up and out no matter who you are. A stink bomb. I got a whole glove compartment full of them. I throw them at white guys, pigeons, people I've dated, etc. I'll smell you in hell. Uh, wait, wait, who, who are you? Those scenes were from her debut season 8 episode, V for Valentine Detta, which I think should have just been called V for Valentine but who am I? After hearing how terrible a guy Jimmy Jr. was in that episode, her empathetic nature takes shape when she's just as upset as the Belchers. I made him a special picture frame for Valentine's Day with a picture of us in it, but then he hung it in his locker with a picture of Becky in it. He what? what? That son of a bitch. Nat's personality is solidified in the season 10 episode, The Ring But Not Scary, where Bob buys Linda a ring and those damn kids lost it at a water park, causing them to have to go out and look for it at night. None of you are allowed to talk to me tonight or maybe ever again. And you're not my children anymore and you're not allowed to come to my funeral. Nat doesn't think twice about doing everything she can to help Bob find the ring. Hell, she probably didn't even think once. And even though they never end up finding the ring, it's still a huge gesture for people she only just met and hung out with once. Oh great, they're here. My ace in the hole, the puff divers, an all-female group of scuba and cannabis enthusiasts I used to belong to before I got sober. I miss everything about it, but I gotta get up tomorrow morning for the rest of my life. Hey gals, Tracy, looking good. Simone, sup? Janet, love the new wetsuit. Leslie, I still have your Tupperware, sorry about that. Carol, still mad at you. Denise, also sup. This is, wow, um, thanks. Why are you doing all this? I'm a big fan of Linda's, Bob. And your kids aren't so bad either. Well, they're actually really bad, but thank you. Frustrating as hell that the audience knows that the ring is sitting in a fucking bird's nest atop Bob's burgers. I just wish I could jump through the screen and tell them. You know, almost every time I think of Nat, the girl power jam comes to mind, which that song actually works perfectly as her anthem, considering that she's a lesbian. And then girl power on six why would she say 16? It's like the weirdest number. Girl power on 16. One, two, three, 
four, five, six. Okay, okay, 16. Let her finish, Mom. Let Girl her finish. Power. Eight. So, okay. Yep. Keep going, Matt. Okay, okay. Keep going. Nine, Six, ten. Ten. Let her finish. Seven. Okay. Keep going, Matt. Sixteen. Girl, Girl power. power. This is the most fun I've ever had. Even though it seems that Nat's relationship with the Belchers is mostly with Linda and the kids, Bob has his own dynamic with her. In season 14, Nat lets Bob borrow her limo without question, which is definitely a level of respect because that limo is pretty much her baby. But even beyond that, I love how Nat and Bob always address each other so formally. Nat! Linda! Kids! Robert! Hello, Natalie. Nat is definitely a fan favorite. We don't get nearly enough of this woman on screen, and trust me, I'm not the only one who thinks so. Take a look at this TikTok from Max over at Bob's Credits, one of my favorite Bob's Burgers YouTubers. Quick question. Which character do we need to see more frequently on Bob's Burgers? I'm not going to play favorites, but... Nat Kinkle is no less than a shiny example of how a good friend should be, and that type of character is deserving of something equally shiny, awarding her the gold medal for the top spot on this list. A bunch of baby garter snakes. Thanks. This means a lot. Okay, they're not getting married, but they're still hugging. Now give me a tissue. Magic. What a day! Nat, I need you to let go. Okay. And I just want to memorize your face. And I've done it. So what did you guys think of the list? Do you agree with my top pick? Ordinarily, I'd respect opinions, but no. If you disagree, we can fight in the comments. I'm ready. I'm also curious what you guys' list might look like, so post your top 10 in the comments after the beef is settled. Speaking of beef, I've recently gotten into the Great North and binge watched every single episode, so I've been considering expanding my channel to cover that show as well, so let me know if that's something that you guys will enjoy. I've got a few ideas up my sleeve already. Anyways, I'm the Bobbist. Be safe, stay warm, and go watch some Bob's Burgers with your Natalie. Where the writers wasted no time establishing the aforementioned rivalry. Af after af is it aforementioned or is it aforementioned? Calvin Fisher. Calvin Fisher. Thumbnail poses. This is a girl power team.